In this installment of the Borlaug Institute's Fall 2013 seminar series, the Honorable Marty McVeigh discusses his role as a presidential appointee of USAID's Board for International Food and Agriculture Development. McVeigh is also president of McVeigh & Associates, LLC of Houston. We join the presentation as Borlaug Institute director Dr. Elsa Morano introduces McVeigh by reviewing the critical importance of agriculture and development work. We like to talk about agriculture at the Borlaug Institute as being the, the pebble that, that causes the ripple effect because if, if you have an efficient agricultural production in your country, you have uh, people beginning to be able to feed themselves, their families, they prosper economically, they can send their kids to school, and then an educated population is a robust, prosperous population. And from that, you get so many benefits of <coughs> health and uh, social issues and so forth, and frankly, a sustainable planet in the end. So uh, it all begins with agriculture. So I'm, I'm very excited to have so many people here uh, this noon to, to hear uh, Mr. McVeigh's uh, presentation. You, you've seen here a little bit, and you no doubt can't read all the fine prints, especially if you're sitting back. Uh, there. Uh, Mr. McVeigh, uh, the Honorable Marty McVeigh, is, is a member of uh, a board that advises the administrator of USAID. USAID is the U.S. Agency for International Development within the State Department that does fund a lot of the development work that we do at Borlaug Institute and uh, lots of other uh, entities do as well. Uh, it's a presidentially appointed position. Um, I was a member of BIFAD myself. And that's how I got to meet uh, Mr. McVeigh. Uh, unlike Congress, you know, here I was as an uh, appointee of President Bush. He's a, an appointee of President Obama, and we were working together. <laughs> how does that happen? Um, so, and here he is, a, a great friend uh, of agriculture. Uh, he is from Houston. He's a businessman with a great passion for international work. Uh, he has traveled all over the world um, on befi behalf of BIFAD, uh, looking at projects that are funded by USAID. He and I were able to travel to Haiti together and, and were able to, to give some, some concrete uh, recommendations to USAID on how to do things better in that island. And I'd like to always say that if, if we can fix the problems in Haiti, we can fix the problems anywhere. Uh, those of you who, who have worked in Haiti, I think, can vouch for that. So that, with, without further ado, I'd love to introduce uh, to all of you the Honorable Marty McVeigh, who will speak to us about feeding the hungry. Bring my good friend up here. Uh, who is an Aggie here? And <laughs> uh, I want to thank uh, Elsa for her leadership and uh, and friendship. When I was uh, appointed by the president to serve in this capacity on the board of directors, uh, I, I took uh, uh, great solace in Elsa's leadership and taking me under her wing and and helping me as a as a freshman member of the board and. Uh, out of uh, many benefits to public service uh, that, that exist, uh, the friendships are the greatest. And I've uh, had the privilege and pleasure to uh, call Elsa a friend. And uh, when she called and asked uh, me to come here many months ago, before she even ended it with a period, the answer is yes. So uh, Elsa is a, is a great friend to me and an even greater friend for this university. And I know you all want to give her a big hand. For her. Thank you. And I, I do appreciate uh, being here. I already said howdy, so that, that's how I like howdy. So. And again, thank Elsa for, for her kind uh, introduction. And uh, she left out that uh, I did win a Nobel Peace Prize, but uh, not really. But that's okay. <laughs> not prematurely, anyway. Uh, so I, I do want to thank you all for the warm welcome that I've received here in College Station. And um, a very nice morning that started out. We got to look at a lot of. Uh, uh, different projects that, that you're working on with Tim and, and others, so it's good to spend a little time. So, and I'd first like to say how honored I am to be here with all you Aggies. It's my hope that you will be the future business, 
and agricultural leaders committed to building a better, safer, and more secure world. When I was preparing my remarks, I kept thinking about people that make up Aggieland, that together represent over 90 countries and come from all 50 states. I found myself searching for the right words for such a diverse group. And then I thought of a, a story that I had heard recently about the time that Albert Einstein went to a cocktail party. He introduces himself to a lady and says, Hi, I'm Albert Einstein. What's your IQ? <laughs> she says, 240. Great, we can discuss the mysteries of the universe among other things. And we can have a lot to talk about. Later, he's talking with a man and he says, Hi, I'm Albert Einstein. What's your IQ? 145, he says. Great, we can talk about thermodynamics, says Albert. Later, he met another man. And he asked the man the same question. Hi, I'm Albert Einstein. And what's your IQ? 43, the man manages to say. Einstein gets a puzzled look on his face and for a minute and then says, well, I guess we can talk about the Longhorns. <laughs> <laughs> so forgive me if, if uh, my words today, today give you the impression that I went to the University of Texas. I did not. But like you, I did come here today because I believe that we have a responsibility to improve our world and ensure that every man, woman, and child around the globe can live with hope and security. After touring the Borlaug Center today, I am moved by your enthusiasm to solve problems and your confidence in discussing topics like agribusiness strategies, economic indicators, revenue generation, and preservation of resources. All things that I study, respect, and love to debate. Today, I will discuss topics that are uncomfortable in many circles, and I place a value as equally important and arguably some of the largest threats to American national security. I'm speaking about global poverty, hunger, illiteracy, and disease. <coughs> Today, Americans have instant access to news from around the world, and we are constantly reminded how connected we are to the events in Africa, Asia, Latin America, and the Middle East. We see every day the struggles of millions of men and women who lack access to clean water, health facilities, and regular food supply, all things that we take for granted. We are reminded that extreme poverty still exists in too many corners of the world where over half of the world's population lives on less than two dollars a day. The United States Agency for International Development, USAID, is the United States principal development agency with, broad, with a broad mandate to ease suffering, spread prosperity, and increase security in the developing world. In order to support these goals, President Kennedy created the agency by executive order in 1961. The United States government foreign assistance policy has always had the dual purpose of furthering America's interests while improving the lives in the develop in developing worlds. world. USAID carries out U.S. foreign policy by promoting broad-scale human progress at the same time it expands free societies, creates markets and trade partners for the United States, and fosters goodwill abroad. Spending less than 1% of the total U.S. federal budget, USAID works in over 100 countries to promote shared economic prosperity strengthen democracy and promote good governance, protect human rights, improve global health, advance food security and agriculture, improve environmental sustainability, further education, help societies 
prevent and recover from conflict and provide humanitarian assistance in the wake of natural and man-made disaster. Our assistance, your assistance, develops the markets for the future. Long-term aid recipients have become strong trade partners and are the fastest growing markets for American goods. USAID is the developing partnership, is developing partnerships with countries committed to enabling the private sector investment that is the basis for sustained economic growth to open markets for American goods, promote trade overseas, and create jobs here in the United States. Feed the Future is the United States government's global hunger and food security initiative. It supports country-driven approaches to address the root cause of hunger and poverty and forge long-term solutions to chronic food insecurity and undernutrition. Drawing upon resources and expertise of agencies across the United States government, this presidential initiative is helping countries transform their own agricultural sectors to sustainability, growth, and, and the ability to feed the, their own people. Feed the Future Agenda represent a $3.5 billion pledge to work with partner countries, development partners, and other stakeholders to tackle globe secure, global food security challenges. Our collective efforts advance global stability and prosperity by improving the most basic of human conditions the need that families and individuals have a reliable source of quality food and sufficient sources in which to purchase it. These efforts in turn ultimately advance international security. Nearly 870 million people, or one-eighth of the world's population, suffers from chronic hunger. By 2050, and in your lifetime, the world's population is projected to increase to more than 9 billion, requiring a 60% increase in agricultural production. Investing in small farmers remains the key to unlocking agricultural growth and transforming economies. 75% of the world's poor live in rural areas in developing nations, where most people's livelihood rely directly on agriculture. Studies show that growth in the agricultural sector has up to three times greater impact on poverty reduction than growth in any other sector. In 2009, G8, at the G8 summit in Italy, was a pivotal moment for hunger and poverty reduction. There, President Obama called on global leaders to reverse the three-decade decline in agricultural investment and commit to putting food security and nutrition high on the international agenda once again. Together, the G8 countries joined and assembled more than $22 billion for global food security. The strength is a whole of government effort, joining resources and expertise of the United States Agency for International Development, the U.S. Departments of Agriculture, Commerce, State, Treasury, the Millennium Challenge Corporation, the U.S. African Development Foundation, the Peace Corps, the Overseas Private Investment Corporation, and the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative. With the focus on smallholder farmers, particularly women, Feed the Future supports countries in developing their own agricultural sectors to generate opportunities in economic growth and trade, which can help reduce poverty and hunger. The endeavor is expected to reduce the prevalence of poverty by 20 percent, and the prevalence of stunted children less than five years of age by 20 percent in nations where your government works. As recently as December, 
Feed the Future has already helped 1.8 million food producers adopt improved technologies and management practices that can lead to more resilient crops, higher yields, increased income, and has reached nearly 9 million children through, nutri tri through nutritional programs. This can prevent and treat undernutrition and improve child survival. But when thousands of children die from the agony of starvation, it reminds me and sends all of us a message that we've got a lot of work to do and a lot of work ahead of us. We work to achieve this by supporting the food security <laughs> priorities of our host countries, promoting collaboration at the U.S. domestic and international <laughs> level, focusing on women as part of the solution, engaging with the private sector and civil society in a meaningful way, and advancing great ideas through thought, through research and innovation, similar to the ones found here at this great university. By supporting stronger economic climates with free markets, improved infrastructure, and new technologies, we will help build resilience and equip communities with the tools, the knowledge, and the enabling environment to thrive in times of prosperity and to overcome difficulties in times of hardship. It is my strong belief that in helping to create economic opportunities in developing nations, these collaborative food security efforts generate economic growth and promote global stability, which benefits us all and creates a world with greater security. After decades of neglect and avoidance, we join together in the fight against global hunger, and it must be the front forefront of global development. I am enormously certain that the real development not only providing relief, but also advancing economic growth, a broad-based internal growth actually helps independent nations to fully develop and will rise people out of poverty. The sole purpose of development is to create the conditions where assistance is no longer needed and self, a self-sufficient state remains. Food security is a moral necessity, but it is also an economic imperative. <coughs> World history reminds us that one of the most effective ways to withdraw entire nations out of poverty is to invest in their agricultural development. As we have seen in Latin America, in Africa, and in Asia, a growing middle class will result in growing global markets. The American people have a natural self-interest to be partners in that growth. As I said, it is a moral necessity, it is an economic imperative, and it is a security obligation. We've seen how sharp increases in food prices can overnight force millions of people into poverty, which in turn can spark riots and military conflict that cost lives and lead to long-term regional instability. This danger will only grow if a surging global population isn't matched by surging food production. So reducing malnutrition and hunger around the world advances international peace and security. And that includes the national security of the United States. Tanzania, Ghana, and Ethiopia are good examples of countries to admire because of their evidence of improving agricultural development and increasing food security. I know that there's always going to be doubters. There always are. We see heartbreaking images. Farmers' fields turned into dirt, babies with swollen stomachs, and they say it's hopeless. And that some places in the world are just condemned to eternal poverty and hunger. 
but I know that the sensible, sensible people in this room today disagree. I think that most of the American people disagree. Anyone who claims great change is impossible, I say look to the extraordinary successes in our global efforts. In the last 18 months, I've traveled to Haiti, Libya, twice to India, twice to Nepal, twice to Bangladesh, representing America's dedication to global development. I returned a few months ago from South Asia after reviewing the progress of the Feed the Future program. I can name a few examples of development progress right now from other regions in the world. In Rwanda, farmers are now more, are selling more coffee as a result, lifting their families out of poverty. In Haiti, where Dr. Morano and I traveled, some farmers are more than, have more than doubled their yields. In Bangladesh, and in the poorest region of Bangladesh, they've had first ever surplus of rice. I can assure you that there are millions of farmers and families whose lives are being transformed right now because of some of the initiatives that we're talking about today. And that includes a farmer in Ethiopia who got a new loan, increased his production, and hired more workers. And he said, this salary changed my life my kids can now go to school. There's an old saying in Texas, we're all Texans here, you give a man to feed a, a fish and he eats for a day, you teach a man to fish and you teach him for a life, feed him for a lifetime. By addressing the root causes of poverty and enabling communities to solve their own problems, we see positive results that continue to multiply over time and over generations. I am proud of my country <coughs> and because you share the same feeling towards your countrymen, we can build bridges of understanding that will bring hope to millions. We can let others know that solutions are at hand and help is soon on the way. As an American and all of us as Americans, I can say that the people that we represent are very generous people who have time and time again supported turning values into action. And as a compassionate nation, we know that we cannot ignore the needs and dignity of the world's poorest people. We know that helping others to help themselves is the true meaning of partnership. It is the responsible thing to do. It is the right thing to do. That is how we can ensure a better future for our children, our grandchildren, and peoples all around the world. We must progress in the direction of progression. Together we can do this. Together we can set free the change that reduces hunger and malnutrition. Together we can ignite the kind of economic growth that raises entire nations out of poverty and despair. This is the commitment that we must all make together. I have pledged that this will remain one of my chief priorities of my life and I will continue the journey with you. It is my expectation that you will act responsibly in the future and promote the uh, evolution of our world. So thank you very much and gig them, as you say. And I think we'll, we'll take some, a few questions Absolutely. And with uh, my colleague. Questions? Yes, sir. <coughs> Can you first yeah. tell them who you are and then okay. ask? Uh, my name is Kirsten Hapo. I'm an institute for the Environment and Biotechnology.
He's, he's a cotton oh, guy. Oh, okay. Right there. I ate some cotton in your lab today. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't taste very good. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, anyway, uh, I think one of the biggest causes of uh, you know, hunger and malnutrition is population growth. And it seems to me that we have just stopped talking about it. We almost resign ourselves to <coughs> thinking that yes, we will be 9 million plus whatever in 2050, and we just need to somehow figure out how to solve the problem. But why not, while we're trying to solve this problem, why not also at least talk about it and do something about population growth? Certainly, and that, that's, a, that's a good question. Thank you for that. And, that, and part of the, as I said in, in um, my talk, uh, part of what the agency is doing and, and part of the Feed the Future program is, is health and education in, initiatives. Uh, you know, you, you go to parts of the world where, uh, you know, uh, planning a family is not uh, uh, socially acceptable for either religious purposes or just social purposes. So uh, offering uh, education to uh, the countries and hope that they come along is, is key, and it is, it is being done. Uh, if we can slow the um, population growth, um, it, that's, that's a big key to it. Uh, certainly education, I think, is, is, at, is the key to that key. Um, we don't know how to, how to necessarily break down uh, those uh, borders because you, it, when you go into a country, you want to protect their sovereignty and, uh, and their rights and what is the norms and customs in their, their country. But certainly offering them the education is, is um, at the forefront. The, the, to all the students here in the room, the, when I said that there's a, the, by, in your lifetime, 2050, there'll be over 9 billion people in the world, that should scare the hell out of you. Uh, and we have to act now because we cannot sustain uh, and be able to feed that population with the technologies and, and the capabilities that we have today. So I think that the, um, your labs and the work that you're doing in this university and others that, are, that I've been to, been to the University of Missouri this year and uh, University of Louisiana and some others, uh, this, is, this is it. I mean, this is what's going to save the world. And I, I can't stress that enough that conflict will break out and it will, wars will no longer be fought over oil and gas, but over food. And, you know, we have to combat that and the, and the fight begins now. So it, controlling the population, back to your question, is, is, is a big deal. Yes, sir. You, you. Yes, sir. Uh, Less BSC 127 Ministries, we're working in Rwanda right now, mm -hmm. looking at economic initiatives that we might be able to assist the folks there in the vein that you were talking about. You commented on uh, <coughs> partnerships and the moral imperative of helping because the future from what you just said, it's kind of challenging. Where do you see the space between government USAID and faith-based organizations to not work in stovepipes, but work together mm -hmm. towards the same end? Well, that's, uh, uh, that has been a problem for decades, that NGOs or faith-based organizations um, are certainly they have similar interests with, with that of the U.S. government and U.S. policy, but where, where's the link between them? And um, under uh, this administration, I can't speak to others, but certainly under this administration, the President has uh, initiated a whole-of-government approach where we are sharing resources between agencies that, that uh, actually it's a cost savings, but it's also a um, better work product that we, that we receive. Um, you know, you don't need uh, USDA or uh, shouldn't be reinventing the wheel that USAID is doing the same thing. We need to be able to share information and resources and technology. So um, I, I, I do see an improvement. Uh, again, I can't speak to previous administrations, but it, it more needs to be done. Uh, and it's, it's certainly uh, trying to undo the culture of the United States government in order to, to work uh, across agencies and to, to um, 
work with NGOs closer, and so there's information sharing back and forth. Because I, I do see when uh, Dr. Morano and I were in Haiti together, we, we witnessed that firsthand where you have really good ideas regardless of where they start, but there's, there's no mesh of those ideas and no share of those resources and those, those dollars. So you've got this stovepipe, as you, as you uh, rightfully uh, colored it, um, <laughs> effect, and less people get served by that, and it costs more money. It's very inefficient. So I, I, I certainly hope to, uh, uh, that we'll continue on the path of, of having a whole of government approach. Yes, sir. Two questions. Oh, sir. Um, really wonderful talk, very, very meaningful. Um, one question I have is, it's often been said that distribution of food is one of the major problems. I wonder if your agency was also working to make it easier to distribute food from where there is excess to where there is need. And the second point was, what is being done to make transgenic plants more acceptable more quickly? Because this is, to a large part, the answer to the question and the problem. Sure, thank you. That's two good questions. One I can probably answer, the other I can't. Uh, you figure out which one it is. <laughs> I'm no scientist. Uh, but it's getting the, the food distributed efficiently um, is, is a big challenge. And I, I spoke at the, uh, uh, the Global Food Banking Network, or excuse me, Global Food Banking Annual um, uh, meeting uh, that was probably I think back in May or so and that was a challenge that they had that the governments are, are not uh, working quickly enough and efficiently enough to distribute the food before it even goes to waste so a lot of food is just wasted because of uh, bureaucracy there is no uh, streamlining of, of uh, those resources especially in developing countries where you see um, corruption as a big challenge to that, um, and that's uh, that's a huge roadblock. So, I, my wish is to continue to work with with global food banking uh, efforts around the world. Each most countries have them. We have them here. I, I know San Antonio has them. Houston has them. Uh, but in, in particular, in, in developing nations, they they are used as a way of life, and it is the only food that uh, many people actually receive. So, you know, throwing away tons of, of grain just because it's set in a, in a warehouse for 60 days too long because somebody didn't fill out the paperwork is, is a shame. And, and that does tie back to uh, at least this administration's um, efforts to uh, better the whole of government. So as far as your second question, I, I you know, I don't know. But <laughs> I'd love to know, and I'll, uh, uh, if you let me write that down, then I'll, I'll send you an email with the answer. I'll find okay. out. Thank you very much. Sure, sure. Question over here. Yes, ma'am. I'm Julia Stanker. I'm a PhD Hi, Julia. student. Hi, I'm a PhD student in bilingual education. Okay. And my topic has to do with children who come here from Central America and accompany you, um, just seeking asylum because their countries are war torn and so much poverty. Mm -hmm. and the repatriation process of that. Mm -hmm. But um, my question is, how does the program go about identifying communities that are ready for their assistance, and can, can communities be nominated? Um, that, that's a, um, uh, really a country question. So each country uh, that we work in, uh, the, the embassies and the um, the aid staff in country work very closely with the uh, the host country's government, and really we don't want to be pushy Americans. We're we're you know we want to give advice and counsel, and we want to, to we have expertise obviously that they don't. We have resources that they don't, but we certainly always want to remain welcome in their nation. So as we help them develop and become trade partners, uh, we we expect that. Um, you know, we're democracy building, that we're building free markets and free enterprises, and we're duplicating uh, the American way of life. So the answer to your question is we rely on the host countries to tell us where the needs are. Now certainly we make suggestions and, and contributions, and if they're completely wrong, uh, it's, I trust that the, the uh, uh, <coughs> local 
staff there would, would be able to lead them or coerce, coerce them in the right direction. But that's, we rely on the country to try to tell us that. Question. Yes, sir. Yes, my name is Boris Fleischman. I'm assistant professor in assistant science. Can, can you speak up just a little, sir? Thank you. Thank you. My, my name is Boris Fleischman. I'm an assistant Hi, professor in ecosystem science and management. And my question for you is, uh, I hear that the government is shut down, and I also read that when <laughs> people are surveyed about what they think the government should be, spending money on. Mm -hmm. Foreign aid is usually at the you know at the top of the list of things that are unnecessary when when these surveys are out. So I'm wondering what the agency is doing or what you would recommend doing to increase the public understanding of the importance of the very good work. Thank you. Uh, I also heard that the government was shut down. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I hope that that, that resumes uh, quickly. And, um, uh, you know, I think that the men and women that continue to go to work every day or, or serve, I, I'm getting emails from agency staff that are, that are furloughed, but they're working at home and they're continuing to work uh, because they believe in the work that they do. Uh, but it's the agency, as far as Washington is concerned, uh, is pretty much on a skeleton crew. There are essential personnel that's, that's there that cannot leave. Uh, we have to be able to support uh, our folks in, in, uh, out of the country. Uh, the, those programs must go on. They must, they're at critical stages. Uh, embassy staff and, and the, the USAID is housed in, in every embassy in the world. Um, you know they can't leave, and and we must continue to support them. But uh, I hope that uh, this is over quickly. Uh, it does have a, a massive economic impact, not only on our country, but what it means to the rest of the world. Uh, I'm very concerned, obviously, about uh, uh, the message that it sends abroad uh, in the stability of the United States, um, regardless of of the outcome. Uh, I want the government open. That's my government. That's your government. We paid for it. We earned it. They need to get back to work uh, and serve us. So um, I, I certainly hope that uh, we're able. They're able to resolve this quickly. It, it's uh, at at some point we'll reach uh, uh, a danger of uh, catastrophe. I think we have questions. Oh. My name is David Smith. Hi, David. Uh, I'm interested in food production and how this uh, can help alleviate poverty. Excuse me. <laughs> um, you mean talk to him? <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the things that uh, I've come out about in my studies is um, agroecology, and this is uh, something that's promoted by the UN Special Report on the Rights to Food. Mm -hmm. um, it's a, um, a process of doubling food production in entire regions within 10 years while mitigating climate change and alleviating uh, rural poverty. And I was wondering how the USA ideas, uh, um, if they are using this technique or um, if we can possibly integrate this technique into uh, helping alleviate poverty as our population continues to uh, grow and right. poverty is increased also. And, and that, that's also a good question because it, it ties back to what we I talked about earlier, which is a whole of government approach. Uh, the UN is in uh, many parts of the world where our government is also involved, and you know they have a different initiative uh, sometimes than what uh, our government's initiatives are. Uh, keep in mind that this is um, I always. Um, try to, you know, when I tell people, nobody knows what the hell USAID is. Nobody's really heard of it, but it's a huge part of um, uh, global development. Um, and, you know, it is, unfortunately, it, there, there are some politics involved to it. As, as administrations come in and administrations go out, the president's initiatives change. So uh, trying to stay flexible and is it, sometimes a detriment. Uh, the UN um, certainly has a, a very different uh, um, <coughs> mandate, but I think more more times than not they're they're working simultaneously, <coughs> just differently. I, I wish that there was more collaboration because there there's efficiencies that could be gained from that. Uh, 
couple more questions. Uh, one over here. I'm Bob Knight, and my statement hey, <coughs> may seem to be uh, an oversimplification of all this, but keyhole gardening can be a solution for a small locale. A keyhole gardening is um, new to me. It's been done in Africa before, and the purpose for keyhole gardening is to provide food for a family, and they can create their own keyhole garden and get the resources uh, right there locally and build it and provide enough food for them on a continuing basis to sustain themselves. And I will be glad to send you the information on this. I have three and I'm building three more. Great. And um, it's an awesome way to provide food pretty quickly for a small group. Absolutely. And that's 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 right. It's it is um, it's it's not new to the United States. Um, and I'll tell you why, because our nation was founded on keyhole garden. Agriculture built this nation. Uh, it was uh, farmers were thank thank God somebody was here to teach us how to do these things but uh, that's how our nation grew and it grew from agriculture so the, the proof of any doubt that agricultural is not the key to economic prosperity and to security is to look at this nation we are a nation of farmers this country was built on agricultural development so I, I would love to, to read what you have I'm always interested in that but uh, it does work and just to touch on that a little bit more, when you go to uh, countries that um, need education in this type of garden, where a plot of land that they have to feed their family is just a few square meters. So being able to teach them how to increase their yield and protect the crops that they have uh, <coughs> creates uh, an environment where they can feed themselves and actually sell off uh, excess product and create that there's an economy that's that's created by it so it is it is extremely important if not one of the most very good yes sir uh, my name is Devar uh, Reddy I work for the libraries uh, my question is on one side we are talking about food security increasing food production etc in developing countries whereas in the developing countries concerned especially United States we are trying to use the food crops uh, like uh, corn so sugar cane, uh, soya bean oil, and uh, all the things for the biofuels. Do you just paint? Well, I, I am um, never a, a supporter of um, uh, trading food for fuel. Uh, I'll always pick food every time. So I'm I'm not. Uh, interested in food products that are grown for fuel production when uh, half of the population of the nation could be starving. So the the solution to that is technology and it's again it's done in places just like like this one that uh, develop technology where we're not choosing between food and fuel ever. So uh, hybrid technologies are developing things that nobody wants to eat or can eat or any animal product can, or any animal can consume, uh, I, I support that completely. I, I do not uh, and never will support uh, choosing uh, fuel for food. Yes. My name is Lee Fitzgerald. I work in the Integrative Approaches to Biodiversity Conservation. But my question is about urbanization. So I've heard, you know, the revised UN estimates for human population is about 11.2 billion by 2100. The, uh, the problem with food shortages and food distribution supply. But we also know that all over the world, even in all the developing regions, there, there's a clear trend toward urbanization. So what are you all thinking about the consequences of this urbanization with food distribution and food supply? Well, I, I don't know what what we could do to stop that, quite frankly. Um, 
there's there's um, or, or you know education through uh, population well, control. I mean, urbanization is just reality. Yeah, exactly. So you know, um, it's again we're we're looking at at policy between different uh, administrations and different approaches. Uh, I I hope that. Uh, we will continue on this path that, that we're on. I think it's good, it's a smart approach, um, and I think it'll bear fruit uh, by the time that we're, <coughs> we're looking at 2020 and 2050. The population will increase regardless of, of what we do, but we, we cannot ignore it, nor can we just you know throw up our hands and say that's another generation's problem. It's our problem. Uh, and. Uh, <coughs> I, I, again, my, my hope is that <coughs> future administrations would continue on this path and not um, change the direction where we would steer away from that. So it's there's going to be many twists and turns by the time 2100 <coughs> rolls around. But again, uh, to all the students in the room, what uh, uh, was just said here is accurate, right, and it should scare the hell out of you. Don't you think urbanization creates a lot of opportunities? <coughs> well, certainly there's economic uh, opportunities. There, there's no question. And, you know, hopefully that would spur uh, not only economic uh, opportunities, but technology uh, opportunities. Uh, so it's it's what you do with it. So if we're, we're going to, to do this and it's coming regardless, we need to take advantage of it and, and use it to solve not only this problem, but other problems. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, my name is Chris Young. I'm a first year master's student in the first school studying public policy. I was interested a couple of years ago we saw lots of rice break out in the American public school in the of school. And if you read about it, the research, it's clear that there's a direct link between globalization and global warming and food insecurity. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, are there any, what safety nets are being put in place by this in the United so what what safety nets are being put in place by this safety nets? Okay. Um, not for organizations to prevent or to aid the next type of future that probably would likely occur from an external thing like the drought or some type of thing. Well, there there's no um, there's no one solution, and and consider this like uh, an energy policy of, of any country, and we can use ours as as the example. There's, there is no one clear way and one clear solution. It's a solution that is over agencies, over policy, um, over development. And, and, you know, we have to look at all of those. There's no, everybody in this room, I think, has uh, an interest in agriculture. And there's no miracle food that's going to feed everybody. There's no miracle anything. So the, the solution is... Uh, do everything you can to make sense and we need to have more than one resource uh, to prevent a catastrophe in the future so we need to be able to diversify and to pull resources from wherever they exist C can you speak Martin to what AID specifically how it takes into consideration climate change which is what you're talking about and there's lots of Things that they do. Well, uh, back at, at basically education. I mean, we're you know, it's everything comes back to education, and I think that's that's the principal reason. Second reason why I'm here today. First one is because Elsa told me to, but <laughs> but the first one, the second one is is education, and this is where it begins. Um, and you know, the world really doesn't understand unless they're in development, they're in technology, or in. Um, uh, Folks in, in New York and the financial center certainly understand this because it's there's nothing to sell if you don't invent it and you don't perfect it. Uh, and it, it's how certainly how we use that. So to the uh, environmental policy, it's all, it's all education, pure education, because we go to developing nations that a huge majority of the people don't read and write. You, you, you want to uh, educate them into here's what we have, here's what we've learned, this is what we've discovered over the last century or two, and, and bring them up with us. So it is in our interest, in our American security, national security, that we help them help themselves so we don't have to continue to do, do the work for them. This agency is not a handout. This, the objective of this agency 
is to promote American interests around the world and to protect Americans. That is, those are very broad things, but that is what we're, we're here for, and it is in our, all of our interests to help people help themselves. Well, I think maybe on that note, we'll go ahead and give uh, Mr. Maivea the round of applause. Thank you very much for coming here and for uh, you know, well, it's, talking it, to all of us. It, it really is my pleasure, and I, um, I, I'm very excited about your, your lecture series, and I've seen some, the lineup, and um, uh, you know, it's, I'll certainly be back if you'll, if you'll have me, but uh, also uh, I'd certainly like to be in the audience because <coughs> I, I see some great speakers that you have lined up. Uh, and again, I, I appreciate your friendship uh, over the years, and uh, I am not only Elsa's friend, but I am a friend of this university, and uh, all of you, so uh, hopefully you'll, we'll see each other again. Excellent. So thank you.